I'm Hannah Hamill. I'm here with Leon Siegel of the SSRC's Northeast Asia Cooperative Security Project. Thank you for talking to us today. My pleasure. So you recently testified in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, on a strategy for dealing with North Korea. What is your strategy for dealing with North Korea and what are some other views well, on how to do so? I mean, basically, I mean, the starting point is to understand that there the, the North has for 20 years pursued a fairly consistent policy, unlike the United States, um, in, in which they've said, in effect, if, if, if we regard the United States as our enemy in the sense that you keep on threatening us. We feel threatened, therefore we need to build nukes and missiles to counter that threat. If the United States is willing to end enmity, or what the North Koreans refer to as the hostile policy, then we will no longer feel threatened, and they say uh, they're willing to give up their nukes and missiles. So basically what I was arguing before the committee was, first of all, we've got to focus very clearly on doing what it takes to see if North Korea is serious about when it says they are willing to get rid of their nuclear weapons and their nuclear programs, their missiles and their missile programs, uh, in return for an end to enmity. And we have to do very concrete. The North is not going to settle for words from us. I mean, they've heard words from us for years. They don't believe a word we say any more than we believe a word they say. And so the, the question is to structure a series of agreements in which we live up to our end of the deal as long as they do. So. Uh, in the end, the only way out of this box is to negotiate in good faith with the North Koreans and see if they live up to their end of the bargain. There are no guarantees here. Uh, I'm not saying the North Koreans will necessarily do the right thing. Uh, quite the contrary. I'm saying you structure the deal so that if they don't, only then do you not live up to your end of the deal. And let's see how far we can get. So you believe that the new UN sanction, I think UN sanction 1874, well, and there's a, you know, there's a subsequent resolution. Since then? Uh, we, we, have a, we have presidential statements, uh, oral statements. Yeah, and the, look, the UN sanctions are worthless. Okay? They're not going to get the North Koreans to do what we want. Uh, if they make people feel good, I guess let them feel good, but they, they are under the misapprehension that these are going to do any good. Um, the North Koreans had never responded well to sanctions, and, and I would just note their initial response to this set of UN sanctions. The first, first thing that happened was a presidential statement, and the North Koreans turned around and tested a nuclear weapon. Then, then, then the UN actually voted tough sanctions, and the North Koreans went and tested a new medium-range missile. I mean, if that's evidence that the sanctions are working, they're not working in the way that people say they should. But if their response to sanctions, you know, that are not even completely rules, just kind of guidelines, if I've gotten the right idea from what I've read, is to retaliate almost in a way, isn't the, the fear that they won't, they won't cooperate in negotiations kind of warranted? Why? Have you tried negotiating? Uh, sanctions are not negotiations. Negotiations are when you sit down and you say, okay, this is what we'd like from you. What do you want in return? And then you decide, okay, is, is what you want from them worth the price of what they want in return? And you then structure a set of deals step by step to, and then see if they carry out what they're supposed to do as you, as you are carrying out what you're supposed to do. What the North wants is a fundamental new political and strategic relationship with the United States. In plain English, they want to be our allies. What do you think? Well, there, I mean, there's, there's rumors or stories coming out that Kim Jong-il is planning to transfer power to Kim Jong-un, his youngest son. What do you think that will do in terms of the regime change and new negotiations? First of all, there's no, at this point, we don't know anything. Most of this stuff comes out of South Korea as part of a disinformation campaign. I mean, I've seen this happen many times before when Kim Il-sung passed away, there was this kind of campaign. Uh, clearly, a succession has been in train since 
early in this decade. Okay, it kind of paused for a while. Um, the way the North Korean regime has has solved the problem of regimes like it. I mean, what, what happened? In, what used to happen in China and 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 the Soviet Union was the rivals got killed off. Okay, North Korea has solved this problem essentially by a Confucian way of passing it on to the, the children of the ruler. Okay, this is a very old-fashioned way. Uh, the British have that system too, by the way. Uh, and, and so one assumes that somebody in Kim Il-sung's family is going gonna, is gonna to inherit. Well, I think the third son is more likely than the others, but we don't know that yet. The former Secretary of Defense of the United States Bill Perry once said, you have to deal with North Korea as it is, not as you wish it to be. If I want to stop North Korea from making nuclear weapons, I'd much rather deal with Kim Jong-il, because I know that any deal I make with him is more likely to, he will be more likely to carry out than any successor. Thank you. So do you have any final comments you'd like to make? From what we know about North Korea, Life is not easy for the vast majority of North Koreans. I don't speak Korean. Um, visitors, as a rule, even the people who work there delivering food, don't get to roam around freely. You are. This is a very watchful regime. It is very insecure about foreigners. But there are things you can observe when you go to Pyongyang. Um, one of the things that strikes you, certainly struck me, um, and, and nobody tells you about it, but when you see it, it's graphic. North Korea is the only place I've ever been to where when you see a family group with kids in their late teens or early 20s with their parents, it's the only place I've ever seen where the kids are shorter than their parents. And that tells you something about the food situation 10 years ago and how bad it was. And remember, I was in Pyongyang where things were a lot better by various reports than they were in the rest of the country. This is a very poor country. A, you know, not quite at the very bottom of the heap of, 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 of the world, but pretty close to it in terms of GDP per capita. It, it has managed to make do uh, in ways that I think are quite appalling to many of us, but, but still they've tried to feed their people in various ways. They even, for the last 10 years, did significant things to allow freedom of movement because people were going to get food to China and coming home with it. Um, they've managed to survive the worst. So the thought that it's anywhere near collapse, there's no evidence of that at all. Quite the opposite, they're, they're up from the bottom at this point. Sure, thank you very much. Sure.